a nova explosion will occur this year and you will see Nekidai. It's called T Corona Borealis, T CRB or T Carbor and you will learn from the best that science has in this field. You will know why this will happen and why scientists can be so sure about it. Therefore, I will reveal you the secret story behind this amazing event so you can understand and trust what's happening. And right now, one of the best scientific sources for this huge event is Dr. Brad Schaffer. Dr. Brad Schaefer, Professor Emeritus of Physics and Astronomy at LSU, is a renowned astronomer who contributes across many areas, including supernova cosmology, nova, recurrent nova, gamma ray bursts, solar system astronomy, and the history of astronomy. Dr. Schaefer has been studying T. Coronae Borealis intensely for many years and is very probably the singular most qualified person in the world to speak on the subject of T. Corobor. This video is based on the knowledge he shared with the American Association of Variable Star Observers called AAVSO. The first record we have was in 1217, more than 800 years ago, Birchert, the abbot of a monastery near Augsburg, Germany, and probably one of the most learned men in the country at that time, wrote about the event that happened in the sky. He told that he saw a wonderful sign in a certain star in the west. The star was located in Corona Borealis constellation, and the star was originally faint, it shone to a great light and then returned to its original faintness. And the return had to have been over a little less than a month, given the position in the sky. And Burchard explicitly used the word stellar, which means star. Then in 1786, a very reputable British astronomer, Francis Wollaston, registered it in his star catalogue, doing astrometry. Astrometry is the branch of astronomy that involves precise measurements of the positions and motions of celestial objects. In 1866, novae sightings were rare, with only supernovae documented. Then, Ticorobor burst onto the scene near Corona Borealis, sparking disputes over its discovery. Ultimately, three independent observers claim credit. Schmidt, a renowned visual observer, noticed its sudden appearance while sky-watching for other projects. T. Corobor peaked at magnitude of 2, declining to around 10th magnitude, remaining observable for decades. It was the first nova extensively studied, setting the standard for future observations. Initially, its cause was a mystery, with theories ranging from meteor storms to stellar collisions. Despite uncertainty, scholars meticulously observed T. Corobor, seeking to unravel the enigma of Novae. But then, in 1920, we had Leslie Peltier starting observing it. In his famous book, Starlight Nights, he has a long section talking about T. Corobor. He watched it closely at every opportunity for more than 25 years. He thought that T. Corbor would erupt again, but he had no good reason for it. What happened 25 years later in 1945 was that he kept watching the thing. He found that T. Corbor suddenly started fading more and more. It started fading by even up to two magnitudes. And Peltier reasoned that this was meant that T. Corbor was going to erupt again. This was actually very insightful, or maybe just lucky, but he published that T. Corbor was fading and it meant it was going to erupt any day. And so he kept watching it more and more frequently, and then other people also started keep watching it because of Peltier. Then one night in February 1946, it stirred slowly, opened its eyes, then quickly threw aside the draperies of its couch and rose. He was asleep. He had set the alarm clock for half past 2 a.m. intending to get up and observe some early morning variables, but he didn't. He went back to sleep. Self-pity comes easy at half past 2 on a cold February morning, so he went back to his warm bed. And thus he missed the night of the nights in the life of T. Corbor. It's impressive to know that he fell asleep. That's why I insist so much 
in the simplicity of my Dobson and Telescope setups that are super easy to grab and go, place it outside without loads of accessories that you need sometimes to watch the sky and that will place obstacles to you so sometimes you prefer not to go outside with a telescope and do other stuff however with a simple setup it's more likely that you grab the telescope and go and if the sky is clear i will make sure that you will not lose this event live pointing my telescope and sharing with all of you that's the dobsonian power but it turns out the discover was a gentleman in Russia named Kamenshuk and he actually is not well known. Many secondary sources often attribute the observation to various other people in Europe or in the Americas. But it was actually Kamenshuk who discovered it first. So we had an eruption in 1946. It was incredibly well observed. And the idea here is that this one star went up classic nova eruption in 1866 and also in 1946. Remember that back at that time the concept of recurrent nova wasn't really even known. It was T. Corbor that really set this up. And so here you have a recurrent nova. This is a classic nova eruption that happened more than once. In this case it was separated by 80 years. It was 80 years from 1866 to 1946. And so this is the prototype recurrent nova. After the discovery of 1946, people observed it in great detail and all the way through quiescence and continuing on. And so this is one of the famous stars up in the sky. Now that kind of sets the scene for what we have today. Let's first look at the photometry. Photometry is the science of measuring visible light in terms of its perceived brightness to the human eye and its intensity as perceived by a detector sensitive to light. It's very, very important in astronomy. Let's first off look at the eruption itself. So here is a light curve plot. And this shows the first month of the eruption in here. We have the light curve in the light green for 1866 and in the dark green for 1946, both in the V-band. And you can see that they're identical. They lie right on top of each other. So from here, we learned the lesson that the recurrent nova always have the same light curve interruption. And actually, this is found for all the other recurrent nova. From eruption to eruption, each recurrent nova has the same light curve. And while Tikarbor back in 1866, the first one registered here, reached the 2.0 magnitude, the next one in 1946 missed the 2.0 magnitude at the top. And from the graphic, we can as well see that it will not last long. It will be a fast event. We can see that in just a week, the light curve gone back until below the naked eye view at 6 magnitude. And the peak will only last a few hours, so we don't have much time. That's why I'm tracking it, so I can warn you when it's happening. Then I will place my 12 inch telescope outside and I will point towards it so I can share with you in a live stream. How's that sound? Now let's expand the chart out in time a little bit, from a month to about a year. So here's the light curve we have for the year afterwards. And what you see, what happened is T Corbor faded very fast and it faded down to its one of its pre-eruption levels. And so it faded back to its pre-eruption level and went flat. So you would think the eruption is over, right? But no, what happened is T Corbor about 100 days after the eruption started brightening again. It got up to 8th magnitude and it stayed up at 8th magnitude for about 100 days before going back down to its steady low state level in here. This is a second eruption. Getting up to 8th magnitude done about half a year after the original eruption, no parent connection between the two. But it happened identically in 1946 as in 1866, so this is clearly not randomness. There's something going on to make the timing of this secondary eruption identical between 80 years apart. But this secondary eruption 
theorists had no idea what's going on with it. But something's going on. It's a mystery. And this secondary eruption is completely unique for T Corbor. No other nova or anything like it has shown anything like this. That's what you get from the photometry here. Now this is the pre-eruption time from 1941 to 1946. And in this time the quiescent level was maybe 10th magnitude. But what happened is T Corbor started to fade again and again. And this was the time in which Leslie Peltier submitted his Harvard announcement card saying Wow, look how much this has faded. This can only mean that T Corbor is going to erupt. And he was right. These are all photographic plates that are now stored at Harvard College Observatory. And we can go back and measure and yet remeasure again the plates and get real modern magnitudes from these very old plates. So did you get it? We got a pre-eruption dip every time and after the peak we have a secondary eruption that it's a mystery. As you can see in this graphic that goes until 2023. Now for you to know all these small points of observations were made and they were hundreds of thousands. They were made by people like me and you, most of them. Amateur astronomers that helped to with those observations with a telescope and providing that information to AAVSO, they participated in the whole community. This is the link in case you want to participate and dig deep on this kind of work that should be fascinating for many people. Meanwhile, you should click on this video over here if you want to know another perspective from this T-Carbor event until it happened.